I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. To have an event here, I feel like I deserve to at least, you know, defend a belt or fight for a title uh, in front of a, a home crowd, but the fans deserved it. I have to say, I mean, I've been to lots of boxing events around the world. This is my first UFC event. And I have to say, it's probably the most exciting event I've ever been to in my life. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. He won. He won. Alexander the Great, Volkanovski. Undisputed UFC featherweight champion of the world. Holy How shit. you can't say he's the go? The lights are dimming. What do I do next? There was never a, an option to tap, and then his arm started to tire. The lights started uh, coming back, and I'm like, he's done. That bit of footage is going to go down as one of the greatest escapes of all time. Some people break, some people don't. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to the rematch. Alexander the Great, Volkanovski, welcome to the podcast, mate. Welcome to Straight Talk. Yeah, let's do it, mate. Thanks for having me again. Oh, man. It's, we haven't done this for a couple of years. Uh, in a while. Last time... I don't think you were, you weren't the world title holder, and uh, you were sort of hanging out to become the world title holder. But uh, you were on your way. Um, mm -hmm. I had never any doubt, mate. Never right. any doubt. There we go. Never any doubt. No, no, I'm serious. I mean, I was there. It was very exciting, and it was like like an incredible atmosphere mm. in RAC Arena. Did you get the vibe every time you were able to get out of one of his lambs? Where every time he put, took you to the ground, and you know, you tried to choke you. What he tried to do. You jumped up on your feet and the crowd went mental. Mm. Did you feel that vibe? Yeah, yeah, I did, man. Uh, I felt it the whole week. I felt it. But even even in there and you even see me, a lot of the things I was doing, you know, you'll see me like obviously doing the, the shuckers and that after I got out of the submissions and, and things like that and just sort of trying to talk to him, let him know. It's like, hey, you ain't breaking me. Uh, and for the crowd, right? Work the crowd because I knew uh, you were working the crowd. Yeah, yeah. So like a lot of times, I'll be there and then like do stuff like that. Like don't worry, you know, to the crowd, they're, they're obviously here to support me. So I was letting them know, I was like, we're good, don't worry, um, you know, and things like that. So I was uh, throwing out a few things like that because I was feeling them. You know, I mean, that was uh, definitely helping me because uh, I'm the type of guy that right now, like I can. be not emotional. I wouldn't say emotional, but I can use the crowd, get all all the emotions, uh, you know, I can be sort of, what's the word I'm looking at? Like the adrenaline can go and I can still be very composed. You know, I never used to be like that. I felt like I used to have to try and calm myself down so I could be composed, work to a game plan. And I started realizing over, for experience, obviously, that I work so much better with that. So I was, I couldn't wait to go out there and, and fight in front of the, you know, the, the Aussie fans because I knew that, you know, it was easy. I didn't have to look for something to fire me up because I knew the crowd would. And that's exactly what happened. Well, they did fire. They fired me up. That's for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. it was actually so hectic. I couldn't even get a video of you actually when the fight was on. I got your stuff when you first came into the same, but it was really hard. Like, because everybody was standing up in front of me the whole time. Mm -hmm. And we had great seats. It, to me, I have to say, I mean, I've been to lots of boxing events around the world. This is my first UFC event. Physically, I've been to watch every, I watch all the fights, but it's the first one. And I have to say, it's probably the most exciting event. That I've ever been to in my life, including mm. state of origin, everything. It was just mm. unbelievable. And to see, we had a number of Aussies fighting there. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I'm a big Jamie Malaki fan too. Like, he was awesome. I just thought to myself, these guys, Alex, the whole, the whole lot of you must have been so proud to put on such a great event mm -hmm. for Australia to in, in, engage in. And how do you feel about that? I mean, how do you feel about your position relative to? Let's call it your fans, but all those people look up to you. Do you feel any pressure from that or do you just enjoy it, love it? Yeah, I wouldn't say pressure. I do I do enjoy it. Uh, I, I just wanted to give back too, you right? I feel like uh, the Aussie fans here because uh, they haven't had an event here for a while. Uh, we've had to, not only, even the athletes, we had to compete over in the States or over overseas for, for how long. To have an event here, not only I felt like the fighters deserved, I feel like I deserved to at least, you know, defend a belt or fight for a title uh, in front of a, a home crowd. But the fans deserved it, deserved, a, you know, a, a heap of Aussies putting on a show for them. And that's exactly what happened. You know, everyone did put a show. And as you said, the event, the atmosphere was incredible from start to finish. They were there early. That's the the fans that we have 6 here. 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah. And like usually you go to events, especially when you're in uh, overseas, like in Vegas and that. Like the arena won't be full till the last couple of fights. Like it was pretty much full from the get-go, you know what I mean? And that's uh, 
which is unreal. And that just shows you that they're, they're there to support the, the fighters, Aussie fighters, but not just that. Uh, they, they love the sport and it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, and they're they keen, obviously keen because it's been so long and let's make the most of this. Let's talk about Alexander Volkanovsky's prep. Mm-hmm. So how far out from the fight do you start doing a fair dinkum prep? I mean, you're always training. I get it. Mm-hmm. You're always training. Yep. But when's your full-on preparation start? We took 12 weeks, three, four months. What are we talking about? So we'll have real structure around uh, preparation about eight weeks usually for for a camp like for a specific fighter and things like that for this one we start early as soon as i found out that yeah this was probably happening uh, after um abu dhabi when i went over yeah. there and you know i had to go in the the cage and you know do the face off and all that and i was like he called oh. you out. yeah exactly so i was like this is gonna have to did you know it's gonna happen? happen i did not know that was uh, not uh, a lot of people like oh yeah that was uh, set up and all that it wasn't so i was a uh, before going into to that fight, here, I'm going off a tangent now, but before yeah, that, I, yeah, I, I originally thought, I think I'd rather Charles Oliveira winning because I know I'd fight him soon. I didn't think uh, Islam would. I thought he would uh, probably hold the belt for a while and wouldn't be able to fight for a while. So I was like thinking, even though I might have to fight him in Brazil, at least it'll be soon. I wouldn't have to wait and things like that. And then that happened. He won and then they called me out and wanted to fight in Australia. I'm just like... How good is this? You know what I mean? It just worked out perfect. It couldn't go, it couldn't have went any better. So I was uh, straight away, as soon as that happened, afterwards, I was like, you know, I talked to my manager, talked to my team, I'm like, let's get into it. I want to bring wrestlers in. I want to do that. Cause I knew that I had to, I had to level up in some in some uh, places, you know what I mean? So preparation, we probably did about 16 weeks, to be honest, which I've never, never had real structure that far out. Obviously. It was more specific to wrestling and grappling and bringing bodies in and all that and then the strength program uh, and things like that. So like the, the bulking phase and just eating like, you know, 4,000, 5,000 calories a day and things like that. So all that was for that first block, which would have been a, a good six, seven weeks of that. And then we got into our sort of normal uh, sort of structured camp that we usually do where it's more about getting you ready for the fight. So it was in conditioning and all that type of stuff. So it was a long camp. Alex Volkanovski, I mean, obviously you're still the reigning featherweight UFC champion. Um, and featherweight is what weight in UFC, in MMA? So that's a 65.8 featherweight is 65.8 uh, kilograms. Right, so which is different to boxing. So it's yep. like nearly 10 kilos heavier, just under 66 kilos. Yep. Um, you normally walk around what weight? I would usually walk around probably – 76, 77 max is what I've been the last maybe couple of years. I used to be a bit heavier from, you know, because I used, used to be, be a lot heavier yes, when you played exactly. rugby league. So bringing that weight down, like I would always fluctuate a, a bit more and then the, the fluctuation would just get lower and lower and lower as the years went by. And uh, so I was about 76 would be what I'd walk around most most of the year. Right. And if you're going to fight at 66 kilos or you're going to weigh in at 66 kilos, mm-hmm. rarely would you end up fighting it that way, but you're going to weigh in at 66 kilos. What do you do to get down to from, you know, you walk around weight to 66 kilos without cutting too much muscle, for example, because you need your strength. Yeah, exactly. So that's a, that's where you get nutritionists on board. Like, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a Jordan on there, the fight dietitian, where a lot of people are so worried about getting the weight off that preparation, you know, they start, you know, taken away from their training you know they take away energy like where they should be using in the in the gym so you need to find that perfect balance and um i'm lucky enough to have uh, someone like him on board where yeah i'm eating like a, the, from what i used to do to get down to that weight to now is just you know i'm eating so much more than i'd usually be but it's just you know obviously the structure around it when you eat what you're eating um you know obviously with the carbs you need the carbs for the energy and all that where i used to sort of starve myself of carbs thinking i need to get the weight down as soon as he was on board i ate more carbs than ever uh just things like that so that you do gotta still be pretty strict with what you're eating but it's just the timing of everything and when it, but i mean i'll do that probably from the eight weeks as well uh obviously it starts off a lot uh more calories and then you'll slowly bring that down so it's probably the last three weeks where you really start to try and bring that weight down but again still have the right enough the right amount of energy to get you through the sessions as well so it's it's actually a game changer having someone like that because i could tell you the things that i used to eat to now like in a train like i mean i used to make i used to make soups because uh, i would uh, put like try and take away the sodiums and all that no carbs and i'll fill up on fluids so water so i think that if i'll make a soup you know i'll put a bit of chicken in there and things like that that's what i'd fill up on like you know just fluids so uh things like that just so i could 
get the weight down and all that. And that's when you start having big problems. You start getting sick and all that type of stuff where ever since I, you know, had someone on board, the process has been so much easier. But well, there's still weight to get down. So, uh, you know, as you said, I'll walk around 76, 77 and I've got to get down to 65.8 or six, just under 66. And uh, I'll probably do – I'll get to about 74, 73 a week out. So I've got to do about, seven, you know, six, seven kilograms in that week. And Which that's is a bit of a taste of what you do. So we talk about the water load and mm-hmm. the unload, salt. Give us a bit of a look at that. Yeah, well, that's five weeks. That's when the – Five week once all the hard training is done, we do our last session and then we pretty much start water loading, which is just drinking a lot of water to flush out some of them nutrients. You're going to start uh, pulling back on your your carbs and your sodiums, especially the last few days, you end up going to no sodiums, no carbs. And that's just to flush out all the the minerals and the, the salts and things that and really just start depleting of water. And I'll lose probably a kilo a day through that process, like or close to. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy like the, the science behind it. But uh, yeah, so you you pretty much go from eating a, a fair bit to you have to pull it back. But when you've got the right guys on board, like, you know, they make sure they even getting your meals, they look good, they they try and make it bigger, they'll cut them up in smaller pieces so there's more pieces so it's better for the eyes and little things. So they, they've got their little tricks to really, really get you through a fight week, which uh, definitely helps. Most people haven't been through a weight cut like mm-hmm. that. But when you're eating measured amounts of food – particularly when it's being brought in, like, you know, you might buy from one of the pre-prepared meal organisations, um, it gets pretty boring. Mm-hmm. And you, but you know, you've got to eat mm-hmm. and it sort of becomes a bit of a chore. Yep. And uh, so I noticed you had a chef um, mm. over in Perth. Yep. There was a dude because the, the fight dietitian, which is uh, Jordan Sullivan, he kept putting up posts of the chef dude up there and yep. he would look like he's trying to make everything really interesting for you, not only just you, the whole team, I'd yep. say, that whoever Geordie was looking after. Yeah. Um, it sounds a bit silly, but how important is it for you to actually enjoy your meal? Oh, it is. Because you love your food. I love my food. Yeah, I do love my food. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, yeah, obviously, I do love my food, especially at that point. You're going to want food, right? Because you, you, you obviously got to hold back on a lot. But that bulking phase that I did, that really, I went from being like a foodie, I'm a proper foodie, to like, all right, I'm like, you know, a bit over food because I would just have to force feed myself for so long. So it was funny, uh, like I ended up having like a bit of a mental block. But as soon as fight week come uh, by, I was like, all right, yeah, now I want some food again, you know what I mean? And it really does get you food because they were they were putting like all, obviously I was fighting for the title. So not only they they were doing like all these fancy looking foods and all that and trying to make all different flavors just to really, obviously it can't be salt. So it's a lot of seasoning, you know, salt, if, you know, you want, I love my salt. You know, I love my salt. Mate, and Wogs you love know, salt. Exactly yeah. right. Wogs love salt. Exactly right. So that's uh, something they, they've got to take that right out. So they're trying to get all different flavors and, and things like that. But they were even getting all these little uh, gold um, pieces to put in there just to remind me is like, you know, they were even, that. Yeah, they were even make sure there was two pieces of gold on there. Just be like, you go for two belts and, just little messages like that, like and again, they went above and beyond because of the the magnitude of this this fight. I, f- I really do believe they did that. They had a good crew. They had um, athletes nutrition as well. So Paul uh, Ebsy from Athletes Nutrition, who was uh, helping with the meals, he does all my meals in camp as well. Um, but then they had Chef Mario doing doing a heap because they had like eight fighters, uh, or some maybe more, uh, through the week. But yeah, they they went all out. You know, they even uh, had. Uh, they put land down under on for I think it might have been my last meal I can't remember but they end up having all the Australian flags and all the things like that and the gold pieces and things just to remind me what we're fighting for. Now you have a good team, a great mm-hmm. team. Obviously, Joe's Joe Lopez like is your main trainer, mm-hmm. freestyling MMA yeah. down there in Windang. Yeah, Joe's become a bit of a legend that's for sure. Um, yeah. But he's been everywhere with you. Mm-hmm. And you've been there with him forever, um, and you bring in lots of blokes to train with. Mm-hmm. What was special about this particular camp? Who did you bring in to train with to make sure that you got the the grapple right, the wrestle right? Yeah, well, that's a uh, well, that's where it was key, right? So again, I started this camp sixteen weeks out, and that was to bring in guys like Craig Jones, who's like one of the best grapplers in the world. Uh, my wrestling coach uh, Frank Hickman from the Hickman Bros Wrestling over there, Bang Tao, uh MMA. Uh, so I bring them into again just while I'm doing that that strength block and and uh, bulking block. Just focus on wrestling, so wrestling and grappling and all that type of stuff. Because when I get in camp, that eight week mark that I told you about, that's very fight specific. But I wanted to have a really good base going into that last eight weeks. So it was just, you know, obviously still doing a bit of stand up, but uh, the main main focus was grappling and uh, wrestling. So yeah, again, uh, Craig Jones, one of the 
yeah, one of the best grapplers in the world. He's like 90 kilograms. He's an Aussie guy. He's an Aussie guy that lives over there in, in America. And uh, yeah, he uh, travels the world doing massive seminars. He's very, very well known in the jiu-jitsu, in the jiu-jitsu world. And um, he's obviously a bit of a larrikin too, a bit of a, a funny dude. And like, you know, he's a prankster. So uh, he, he, he uh, does well in our, in our group as well. But having someone like that, not only to train with you, like uh, to be there as a, as a body to, to put me in bad positions because, again, he's much bigger than me and a much better grappler than, than Islam. So I've always obviously got to get used to that type of standard. Uh, and then the knowledge behind it as well, practicing these things that we felt he's strong at, Islam, was good at, and uh, focus a bit on that. Like he even put himself in Islam shoes and played the Islam game for a while before he even came over to the gym. Just little things like that, that that definitely help. And then Frank Hickman, again, we all studying the our, our gyms are, and our teams known for for studying fights and you know making sure we have got the knowledge and, and doing what we need to do to to sort of counter all that type of stuff. So you know we we looked into it. Frank Hickman did a great job. He's a good body to move around with as well. Just having guys like that was was incredible. So they were there the most most of the time, like a uh, through through camp. We end up bringing there on the night. They were there on the night as well. They were in the corner as well. Yep, that's they were what in I mean, the yeah. corner as well. And uh, we end up bringing like judo guys in, like a couple of different looks. We even bring in a sambo guy um, to to come in just to give us that look because we were, just wanted to get as many as many looks as we can. There's a funny story to that that sambo. I don't know if I, I want to yeah, get well, it. Tell it, tell it. Yeah, yeah come on. Well, yeah. well uh, he uh, – yeah, so we want to get it. I think he's uh, medaled somewhere in the uh, in Eastern Bloc, Eastern European Bloc. Uh, medal at in the Sambo Worlds or something like that. So someone ended up bringing his name up, and then we're like, "Oh yeah, that'd be good. Get get a little f- a feel, you know." And then uh, they hit him up, and then he was like, "Oh no, he's going to need it." You know, all these guys do is uh, eat, sleep, and pray, and like you know, as in, I got no chance. Like you know what I mean? Like he's saying that. So already I'm like, you know, who is this guy? But anyway, we need that. We need the look. We'll see how it goes, and then. Going through that whole process of trying to get him in, he was just, yeah, wanted crazy amounts of money. He was like, well, let us see if you're worth it first, you know. But it was just the way he was being. I wasn't very happy with uh, the way that process was. So I was like, all right, well, let's just bring him in anyway. Um, if he's good, all right, we will keep him here. If not, like even though I've got to pay him just to be there, even though I don't know, at least I'm paying him just to show him that, yeah, maybe we don't need you, mate. You know what I mean? Like, you know, who do you think you are type thing? Because, again, I'm not usually like that. I don't – I'm not – but just the way he went about it just fired me up a little bit. Uh, so uh, he ended up coming in and then, yeah, yeah, it didn't end up well for him anyway. Yeah. Like, obviously, it was just grappling, just grappling yeah, and yeah. wrestling. I'm usually pretty pretty gentle and all that, but, yeah, I didn't go as gentle as I would, so. <laughs> he sorted it pretty quick. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so uh, – and then, uh, yeah, so then uh, we end up going with a few of the guys that we had there as well. And then, you know, everyone just just showed him why we didn't need him anyway. So, so I'll leave it at that. So what, Sorry what, to bring, you know, he's probably, like, you know. I mean, he'll be listening he's probably, for yeah, sure. Yeah, he's, he's probably <laughs> sitting there going like, oh, man, no, I didn't say that. Well, you know, we've, we've seen the messages. So. It was pretty funny. In, in terms of grappling, mm-hmm. or grappling team. Someone like Craig Jones who, you know, he's like a bit of, got a bit of a, a myth associated, mytho- mythology associated with him. He's nearly like, I mean, you – you're Alexander the Great and Volkodovsky. Like that's, you know, Alexander the Great has mythology associated with it. The original Alexander the Great. I'm, guy, I'm talking about the guy from 350 BC, whenever it was. Um, as does um, Craig Jones to some extent. Like it follows mm-hmm. him around the world. Mm-hmm. And people talk about Islam being a great grappler. They don't realise how much better someone like Craig Jones is, mm-hmm. relatively speaking. Yep. Can you just sort of explain that? Is like he was was he taught by John Danaher? What, what's the deal? Yeah, Jones? well. Well, that's the that's the thing when the people people will forget that. Don't get me wrong, Islam's a great grappler, great wrestler. You know, and he's uh, yeah, he's very good at what he does. But I mean, uh, then you're going to compare to these guys that all they do twenty four seven, like you know what I mean? There's like that's all they focus on is is jujitsu against some of the best jujitsu guys in the world, and that's you know that's uh, Craig Jones and all these uh, guys. Yeah, he was under Denaher as well. He was actually originally uh, absolute MMA down in Melbourne. Uh, they got. Jiu-Jitsu is very big in uh, Melbourne as well. So they had a big school that he was doing uh, very well. And I think he lost to um, Gordon Ryan. Yep. And then I think he went over there and uh, ended up joining the, joining the team. Like, a, what are they called? Denaher Death Squad, I think yeah, they're the called. Squad, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah. yeah. So he went over there and uh, obviously just they got very, very high level uh, grappling and, and a lot of good guys over there. So he started training with them and 
Then uh, I think there was a falling out and all that. And then a few of them end up going to the B team. They call the, yeah. they call the B team, which is a, a funny story around that. Like obviously he's known for always coming second to to Gordon Ryan. So now he's always like going, oh, yeah, I can't wait to get my silver medal and stuff like that. Like he just he just plays on that. It's pretty funny. Again, he's a prankster. He's a joker. So. Um, that works good. It does. It does. Because that's how we are. We got, you know, we got banter all the time. If you see us uh, fight week, like we're just all, uh, you know, you know, taking the piss, having a good laugh and, you know, having fun. Obviously, there's still going to be serious uh, moments, but the whole time we're, you, we're, you know, there's banter. There's definitely a, a heap of banter and some people break, some people don't, but we all have a good laugh. <laughs> and, and you used to, I remember years ago, you told me you used to go off to um, City Kickbox in Auckland um, as part of your camp before you, you, before you prepare for a, a shot and then, of course, we had COVID and you couldn't go there. I'm pretty sure I saw Eugene Barrowman in your corner. Yep. Did you do some training with him before the, before the uh, event? Oh, so like uh, we did our whole camp at Freestyle uh, here local, locally, Wing Dang there, Freestyle MMA. But uh, obviously we always uh, talking to them. We we're all, we're all uh, one big team anyway. So he was always going to be in the corner. We even bring uh, Brad Riddell who's from uh, City Kickboxing and that as well. And just uh, just staying in touch, but we wanted to bring everyone to us just so we can have uh, that focus around our camp, my camp, uh, and bringing the guys and, and doing a lot of specifics just for me. So, which is sometimes it's good. It's always good to go to to a big gym like a City Kick on big gym with a lot of good fighters and obviously a lot of good knowledge. Uh, but they're they're a big team as well. So there's a lot lot there that you, you know, there's a lot of fighters that need to need you know, need to be focused on and things like that where this one we wanted to not spend so much time on doing class sort of uh, sessions. It was more just the very specific sort of sessions uh, for me. So that was with, your, you know, having uh, Craig Jones focus on things, having uh, Frank Hickman focus on the things and then doing your pads and your sparring and make like a lot of our, our, our sort of uh, sessions that we do were just focused specifically for – for me, Islam in that fight where, you know, it was like no wasted seconds of doing anything else really. I noticed one of the things when you're when you're standing up, when you're on your feet, you move a lot and you're great on distance judging, mm -hmm. judging distance. Now, relative relative size, like when you fought Holloway, all of them, they're always tall, mm -hmm. tall a lot of them would have longer reach than you. Has that been something you have specifically – Build up as part of your game plan. Mm. I know my distance. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, a range that we're comfortable at, where a lot of people aren't comfortable at. Some people uh, deal with that differently, you know. And trying to find me, you can usually usually be hard, or a lot of times they they feel like they're yeah they're safe. And you know, while I'm mixing things up in my movement or that, and just you know camouflaging when I do come in and and when I do commit to to shots and things like that, people find that very hard. It was funny for this one. I don't know if you wanted to get into to yeah, this do, one. Yeah, I do. So with him, obviously, we wanted that movement and all that. But with Islam, he's a very patient counterfighter, and he stays yeah. back. So he's happy, like he's got actually a good distance as well, but he's very defensive and he'll sit back. So it was a tricky one for me where I knew he was going to do that, but it's either I just play a game and then we both play that sort of game and I just like try and touch him whenever I can and all that and play it a bit more safe. I've got to be careful because I'm not capitalizing on the feet. What if he gets a take and I'm losing rounds because of that? You know what I mean? Like I had to do that. I'm not going to tire him out. It's not going to be entertaining. Remember, this is a, you know, you want to keep it fun, but not just that winning's uh, very important, but I felt like we want to break him, we want to tire him and all that type of stuff. So me sitting back and both playing at this sort of a range where, you know, we've been too cautious to, to of when in, when when we want to commit and go in. It, yeah, it wouldn't be the fight that, that I felt was going to be enough uh, to win or be entertaining and things like that as well. So again, he's uh, really good at, at and patient. So he wouldn't uh, overcommit ever. He would just wait for me which is um, he did a good job of that as well, which surprised me. Again, I always knew he had a really good eye and he was good with his distance and things like that. But I felt like, um, yeah, again, he, his eye, he's, he definitely did have a, a, a good eye. And that's why I just had to still commit to what I was doing. So that's why, like, yeah, he would land and then I would land heaps as well. So that was the fight I, I had to sort of do anyway. If I could change things, I would a little bit now, now that I know. Now that I know with the rest, obviously you've got that wrestling fret and things like that. So... That throw, does throw a spanner in the works. But now that I know I can deal with that and all that type of stuff, I mean, I'm looking forward to to the rematch. But, I mean, it was fun. It was uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. You could see I did. But, uh, yeah, when you talk about distance and things like that, a lot of people struggle with with that distance, especially with my movement and all that. They, you know, we always say uh, lead the dance. 
So they're doing things. They think they're, you know, when they're blocking punches, when they're moving and they think they know what they're doing. Oh, I blocked that. I've seen that. They don't realize that I'm just camouflaging everything else. So they block, a, you know, block something. They don't realize that I'm more than okay with that because I'm just going to set you up with something else now. You know what I mean? Like I, that's just, I'm going to blend in real strikes and real committed strikes, ones that I'm planning on really hitting you while I'm doing all that. You know, while I'm, you know, fogging the brain or or just, uh, you know, making them panic and you know, not panic but making them, react to everything I'm doing, pop them off as I go as well. So, so that's a, that a lot of people find that very hard to deal with. I was going to say, how do you maintain your intellectual composure mm -hmm. strategy-wise in the cage? How do you maintain your composure but at the same time your heart's beating, your adrenaline's up? Mm. It's, a, it's a tricky one because obviously I am a composed, I am uh, obviously taking reads and all that, but it's not something that I'm sitting there having this full conversation in my head. These reads that I'm making, yeah, I'm aware of them, but it's a natural sort of, uh, I would say, you're, you you're sort of make it end up being instinct through, through preparation and uh, being able to stay calm through all that as well. It's all in, in preparation, you know what I mean, and experience as well. But a lot of... Uh, Say if I'm, uh, you know, again, I'm putting a puzzle in front of these guys and they're giving me these answers, if that's a, the right word I'm looking for, like give me some answers. That, the answer they give me, you know, I usually have something for that that answer, you know what I mean? Like it goes it goes like that. So obviously I'm going to react to certain things through preparation. That's what we dealt with or me being in front of people and being in that situation before. They do this usually gives me this. So whatever option they give me, I usually have other options for. So it's a it's a tricky one, like – I'm definitely thinking about it in there. I'm definitely composed. I've definitely seen everything. But at the same time, that preparation uh, that, that we've, you know, all that work we put in is really sort of sorting itself out if that you makes know, sense. No, muscle memory for you. It's almost a muscle memory, exactly yeah. right. So it's uh, putting myself in them positions and playing that game and, again, them giving me a certain reaction usually will open other doors for me, you know what I mean? If they change that reaction, I'll, I'll have another answer, you know what I mean? So it's a... Uh, it's, it's it's a tricky one because, again, I'm in there. I am thinking. I am getting reads. There's things that I remember that I do and I'd have to do other stuff and I remember thinking them. But then there's a lot of uh, things that's just happening because, like you said, muscle memory. Definitely. I can understand the jujitsu part when you're on the ground, mm -hmm. the muscle memory. But it's, I think it's a bit probably a bit harder when you're standing up on your feet because mm -hmm. anything can happen at that point. Yep. And do you think at any stage that – look like this to me – that he might have made a mistake and tried to prove a point that he could boot you standing up? Um, which I don't think he can. I, yeah, I, like uh, no, I, th I think it's uh, again his that that's his game. So they even said it during the week, and I knew this is how he fights because again we you know we study our, our opponents, and um, again he's very defensive. He'll wait, and he'll either will commit to you know a takedown as you're coming in, as you're blitzing in, and they're trying to get get to the range, or he'll counter with strikes. So that's uh, what he does. So the, I think they were saying be the matador, matador. You know, like yeah. when the bull's coming, let yeah. him come and find the find the shots, find the, you know, things like that. So I had to obviously try and confuse that. So I'm confusing when I am going in and things like that. But again, he had to sit back. So he was trying to get – he would shoot. He would get the shot here and there. But he started realizing that that was tiring him out more. I wasn't panicking. Um, he could, you know, it was, a, it was a tricky one. So obviously he wanted to shoot, So and he was. Uh, he did say he wanted to knock me out and things like that, but I don't think that was ever – you know, he obviously wanted to get me down. He, he, knew, he knew that was going to be – I definitely felt he was still uncomfortable. Even though I still think he did better than I expected on the feet, I still feel like he was very uh, uncomfortable there. And if he could have chose to get on the ground and just finish it there or, or control me, he would. But he obviously found that hard. And every time he did that, it was a scramble. And, you know, I would come out fresher from that scramble. So uh, I think that was uh, – that's definitely going to play, play a factor in uh, – him wanting to shoot, if that makes sense. Round three, in round three, from a boxer's point of view, his legs had gone on him. Mm -hmm. His legs were like like jelly, which means he looked like he was gassed to me. Yep. Not quite gassed, but you know what I mean, getting there. Can you see that? Um, or your corner telling you? Yeah, we definitely seen it. I think we definitely seen it after the fourth, obviously when he had me in the, that, that body lock and we knew he was because he was just hanging on and that, yeah, that's going to burn your legs out because he's just making sure that I can't get out and he was just like trying to hide his feet so I couldn't get out. So certain things that he was doing, I don't mean there's any disrespect. Obviously, he's trying to get his breath back and wants to win the round, so it's a fight. That's, that's what needs to happen. But, you know, doing that, you know, we've definitely seen his legs get jelly after that fourth. Uh, third, I definitely felt he was uh, slowing down a little bit and I started getting more reads and, and things are starting to turn uh, 
turn to sort of, all right, now he's really struggling. Now he's, uh, you know, panicking because he can't hold me down and I'm starting to get him on the feet. So uh, we definitely seen that. But uh, we knew that he would still shoot. Again, the more more tired he got, the more he would uh, panic, the more he was going to shoot anyway. Even though that's tiring him out, that's just that's his go-to. That's his go-to. Yeah, that's muscle memory for him. Yeah. You know, that's uh, something that is just always going to be there. Um, <laughs> it's just funny, like in certain – in some of them positions, like when he got the body lock – uh, with the the was triangle, the fourth, I can't remember. In the fourth, when yeah. you got the triangle, I was being cheeky. I saw it. Yeah, I saw the. Yeah, oh. yeah. so it's, uh, I was uh, not. You know, again, I, I do that to let him know. I was like, were you talking to him? Yeah, I was. Him in his corner. It was on his corner. Um, what were you saying to him? He got me down, and I was holding his hand. And I think they're like, yeah, obviously wanted him to secure. And I'm like, that ain't happening. I'm up. I'm telling him I'm up. I'm up. So I, he started doing that, and I just yeah, I was like, you know, started just went to the cage. And they're like, oh, you got the thing, you're going to get it. I'm like, oh, uh-uh. like, I'm up, I'm up. So I started going uh, pretty much around, uh, like sort of crawled to them. I ended up uh, again. He went for the shot. It was a good shot, but then I, I felt like I was in a good position. S my legs, pushing on the head. and So I knew he would, he would find it hard to get me flat in the back. That's where he wanted me. So I knew that was going to be a big problem for him, trying to get me actually on my back. If he gets a takedown, I'm going to bounce up. That's what I was saying all week. Yeah, I started uh, being cheeky, going like, oh, no, 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 I'm up, talking to his corner, and I pretty much crawled straight to them. Uh, just so I wanted them to see me get up. So as I went to get up, he's just jumped and got both hooks in. Usually, you know, they'll get one, and I'm usually pretty good at, at blocking that, but me being too cheeky and, like, talking to them, he's just got both hooks in and got me in the, uh, the body triangle and just held that for, for the rest of that round. And obviously, that's when we'll yeah, in that position. Yeah, he tried to get you. Yeah, so, like, he wasn't even trying to go for submissions at that point. I think he knew that. I was very durable there. Uh, I knew that uh, – I think he knew that he'll, he'll waste more energy there. It was just rather than sc- giving me room to scramble and getting up and, you know, making it more of a fight where he's going to get tired, hold there, win the round, which is smart. Like, you know, people can obviously get upset about that and, and things like that. Obviously, I was uh, – people thinking it was frustration, but, I mean, I'm, again, trying to work the crowd and just saying it because, again, he was saying that I was going to break and crumble <clears throat> all through the, you know, the lead up. And I'm like, going, you're saying I'm going to crumble. You said you'll finish me. And now you're just hanging on. You're trying to survive. And so I was just, uh, again, just trying to work the crowd and have a bit of fun with it. But after that is when, uh, you know, he got up and I just let him know that like and stood up and he didn't even want to look at me and he could see his legs were definitely uh, were cooked then. So that's why we went back. And then my coach even said to me, goes, mate, his legs are done. This is it. Let's go. So we knew it was close going into that one as well. So we weren't sure. Obviously, leading in that second round, because like, we're the type uh, of team, or the, my coaches are, they're really good that way. Like, they're not going to, if it's a close fight that could go either way, or even if we think that we won, but we're not sure, we're not going to tell, these, they're not going to tell me that. They're going to be like, hey, we need to work. We don't know. We can't say that for certain. You know, and they're, they're really good that way to always keep me pushing. So, I, I, that last round, I was like, we need this. You know, we need this last round. So I'm, I'm going to go for it. And no, I knew that he was tired and all that, so I was going to really – and I knew by then that he's got no threat for me on the ground. Let's just go. Let's go for it. So that's when, uh, when we obviously picked it up uh, a heap in that last round. It was a very, very good round for me. We thought we did enough. Watching back as well, you know, we very comfortably think that we had the second and third and, and fifth, but, again, it was close fight time. So. You can't call robbery and whatnot because I did. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, well, I that's said, right, straight like, after because I got pretty a, emotional. I just try and be uh, real with it as well, right? Like it was a close round. So, uh, but yeah, us watching it, you know, I think we we definitely did the more damage, and you know, we thought we definitely had that, you know. But what do you do? Well, I mean, some of Australia's greatest boxers were texting me during the period, and they were all saying, "He's got it, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it." And then some of the big, the big household names. And we all started texting after it, robbed. <laughs> Everyone mm. robbed was the really common yeah. word we used. Um, c- can I just uh, t- take you back a, a little bit, uh, yep. if you don't mind? Um, would you ever thought Alex Volkanovski would be you know, the undisputed featherweight champion? You are the pound for pound best fighter in the world in the UFC. He hasn't taken it away from you because he went down a weight. He fought a bloke down, who went up a yeah. weight. He didn't fight someone up a weight. You can hardly say he's the best pound Well, for I've pound. still got that number one ranking. You should have. Yeah, so I still – which, uh, again, I didn't know if they were going to do that, but uh, they did. Again, that's what sort of what it's all about, right? It, it comes – everything comes – if everything was equal, I'm pretty sure – I clearly showed that I was the better fighter and I think that's why they they still got me there and again he's a great fighter he definitely deserves that uh, number two spot but did he do enough to show him that he's an actual better fighter than me especially knowing that I went up and uh, I took 
all the, you know, I was at the disadvantage with, with the size. And totally. Everything. Yeah. So, but do you think Ali Falkonovsky, if you go back a couple of years, would you ever, do you ever envisage yourself it's, to be this dude? I oh, mean, it's uh, it's weird because I still am that dude I was 10 years ago, man. Like I'm, I'm still that guy and, you know, I hear I'm having chats about it, talking about being pound for pound or, you know, last week I was at an arena, everyone singing Land Down Under with me, cheering my name and going crazy and, you know, I, I absolutely lap it up, love it and then I, I get out of there and then I'm just just me again. It's it's weird. It's a, But it, even back then I would picture these things but it happening is just uh, totally different. So sometimes you do sit there and be like, oh, man, like this is crazy. You know what I mean? It is crazy. But then uh, I quickly forget about it. I think I'm very happy that that it's like that as well. I think I don't know what it is, whether it's just where I live and, you know, and the type of person I, I, I am and always been and, and things like that. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's weird. Like I really am. Like most people that, that meet me, that knew me, before all this happened, like they're like, oh man, he hasn't changed one bit. So it's a, it's crazy, which is something I'm proud of, to be honest. Something I'm very proud of, and yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's just, it's it is crazy when I sit here and talk about it, and like me being pound for pound number one, which is a big deal. It's a massive deal, pound <laughs> totally. for pound number one in the you know a massive sport. Uh, featherweight champ defending, and you know again, almost that moment, right? Like that, it was a great moment especially in that arena, you would have felt it like everyone's like, he did it. You know what I mean? He did it. You know, I mean, waiting for my hand to totally. get raised. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it was a huge moment. Uh, I definitely felt it all and, you know, it's just, it's crazy. I think it's a, it's a good thing that I'm always going to be me and I'm never going to let it get to me too much and get to my head or anything like that. And yeah, but it is, it is crazy. Sometimes I will sit there and be like, man, like look at all this. But while I have that that feeling, Ten minutes later, forget about it, and I'm just me again. You know, it's it's weird. Do your family keep you grounded? Yeah, it must be. It must be my family, where I live, uh, my my friends that I still have, and even uh, at the gym and our team, we're all pretty pretty chill. You know, I think everywhere we all keep each other grounded. It's just, I think it has to do with that. It has to do with that. And uh, how does mum and dad feel about this? Oh, they they love it now. Did they, they go to birth? Uh, yeah, they were there. Yeah, yeah, they were there. yeah cool. so they were they were there, they were there uh, ringside uh, with with uh, the wife Emma. It's just, uh, yeah, man, it's funny. They used to, when I first started, they're like, you know, what's this? And even when I played uh, rugby league, they're like, you know, what are you doing, you know? And then started this. They weren't too sure. They didn't watch too many of the first ones. But then uh, now they're the my biggest fans. So they know more about me than me. Like, you know, they know all my stats. They know, they know all my my opponent's stats. They know, like, my division or this guy's coming <laughs> up. He's, you know, they know everything. They watch every interview I do. Uh, they're watching, right? You know, they're watching. Hello, mum, dad. Um, they love it. It's incredible. What about the kids? Kids, they're still young, right? Seven yeah. and five. They sort of get what's going on. They know daddy's doing some big things and a lot of people know daddy and things like that. And But, yeah, I don't, they don't really watch. They don't watch. I've, you know, they've uh, – I think they're – for the Max Holloway, I think they were there for the decision. And, like, you know, they, they were at my, my – uh, dad's place and everyone was around so everyone's like going nuts and you know and things like that so they know it's a big deal but at the same time you know the kids so they're like you know while the, I'm sitting here fighting someone they could probably watch but they're running around with their cousins you know <laughs> what I mean like yeah so it's a uh, it's weird I don't know how much yeah, they do understand it a bit but to the extent I don't know so your your dad's uh, from Macedonia Yes. He's a Macedonian. Yep. And, well, we, and Aussie, we call them Maccas. They're Maccas. Uh, and uh, your mum's from Greece. Greece. She's Greek. Yeah. And uh, it's a fair combination. Yeah. Um, it's a fair combination. Who got to name you? Mum or dad? Who got, who got to? Because, you know, the Greeks and the Macedonians oh. fight over who's, yeah, yeah. who Alexander the Great was. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Trust me, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so who gave you the name? Mum or dad? Uh, oh, I couldn't tell you. Obviously, yeah. I guess uh, both of them. I don't know. I couldn't tell yeah, you. But, yeah, that's a... Uh, that's a conversation that uh, I usually stay out of in the comment section of uh, social media. Yeah, stay away <laughs> from sure. it. <laughs> and, and where did you meet Emma? I met Emma at school, actually. Well, she's like, here we, tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's here, sitting yeah, over there. Yeah, she's over there. Well, we met, uh, well, the internet, really. That's where we first started chatting. But uh, we met at a, it was a under 18s uh, school disco. That's where we first met. Wow. But yeah, we were uh, under 18s. Yeah, man. Like, uh, we've been, was that? 18 years? Yeah. Whew. 18 years. That's so cool. Yeah, so that's, 
That's how long we've been together. So I would have met her before then, which is uh, crazy. She, and and she's uh, been through the the whole whole journey. Yeah, and um, and and loving it, I guess. She's your number one supporter. Yeah, well, that's so, it. It's good. At least now we're in a position where, you know, like I can finally give back and, and things like that. You know, where obviously it wasn't always like that. Nah. Chasing the dream, doing all that. We had to sacrifice a lot. She had to sacrifice a lot. The kids had to sacrifice a lot. But uh, now it's all paying off. Have you, has your life changed? Like, I mean, obviously financially you're earning a lot more money than you've ever earned before and you're in a lot more secure position. Uh, like I still treat myself a little bit but not too much, to be honest. I don't, you know, uh, I just make sure that, you know, we, uh, we you know, the, you know, the families are okay and we're having fun and we go on holidays and all that. I'd rather spend money on that than on myself. Um, but, man, to be honest, it's definitely changed. Obviously, you, you know, you, you're walking the streets and all that type of stuff and it's definitely changing. But at, at the same time, like it, everything still feels the same for me because at the home, you know, I'm just I'm just dad. At the gym, I'm still just the uh, one of the mate. Like you go to the gym freestyle. There's a wall, uh, like a uh, sorry, uh, like a whiteboard, and it's got all the amateurs and pros and, and fighters, and they've got all the names and their records and their next fights and all that. And I'm just one of the names on the on the board. There ain't no special treatment or special spot for the pound for pound. You know, there's it's not nothing like that. It's just we all prepare each other like we would, which is cool. And again, uh, when we're home, it's just you know. Everything's uh, pretty chill. And again, that, that keeps me grounded and something that I'm very, uh, very happy with. And I'm glad that that I've been able to do that through this whole whole process too. Because a lot of people got to, you know, through this sport as well, we talk about being an entertainment business and a lot of people change, like to to please people and to, you know, to maybe get more hype on them Perform. and things like that. And then the money and all that type of stuff and being champion, change their work ethic and all that type of stuff. I felt like I, I didn't change as something I'm proud of. When I often listen to other people interview and they talk about, you know, he's a rugby guy. Um, I'm going to talk about rugby league, not rugby, okay? Okay, yeah. Uh, rugby league. <laughs> How much do you think rugby league actually helps you? A bloke told me when I was there at the fights, Rich Walsh told me, Alex Volkanovs, he's got a third lung. <laughs> so how much do you think rugby league contributed to that? Me and I've, uh, I've always had a, a gas tank, even playing football, even though I was heavier, you know, or to, I mean, I was known for taking, you know, having – two, three hit-ups in a set and just, yeah, just run and always – it plays a massive part. For me as well, like the – the who I was as a rugby league player and that, a lot of that sort of transition to, you know, what I am as a, as a fighter as well. Like I was, a, I was a guy that would – on our 10-metre line where, you know, not many people want the ball because, uh, you know, they want it on there on the try line to score a try. Like yeah. I was always, give me the ball, I'll get us out of here. Hit-ups. Yeah, so I'll give – like in a – I'll push people out of the way and be like, I'm getting us out of here because, uh, you know, I've, I trusted myself to get us out of there and I knew I wanted to be, I wanted to do that and and I wanted to stay, be active and like, yeah, it's just the, the player I was. And I feel like that's uh, who I am in the gym and that all uh, translates into to a fighter. But I mean, being resilient, durable, if you look at the, a lot of the, the, the traits that I have that's made me a champion, what are you going to go down to? You're going to go like resilience, never give up attitude, like adapting or finding a way. Like, you know, there's all these things and I feel like a rugby league definitely plays a big part in that. You know, playing injured and things like that. How many times do we do that? You've got to run in a brick wall. Like you can't sit there and be like, oh, I'm going to choose not to. Like, no, we don't have a choice. You've got to do it. You know, you just got to do it and get it, get it over and done with and things like that. Just being in them uh, positions and I feel like a uh, – you could see how I played rugby league and then you could definitely see why I'm the fighter I am as well, if that makes sense. A lot of it definitely trans translates into into MMA, I think. Well, for those who don't know rugby league, you can't hide in rugby league. No. Nope. You get hooked. Mm -hmm. They'll take you off. You cannot hide in rugby league. And the way you fight is you don't, you don't hide. And mm -hmm. if someone gets you in a position, like, I mean, I've seen you, someone with a, have you in check where you're like, you're turning blue. I thought, I, la I mean, like the last time I saw you, I thought, my God, he's gone. He's going to, his head's going to burst. But you just waited patiently for the mm -hmm. moment, for your moment. And then when the grip came off, you got out. Yeah. And uh, that, that, to me, that's, to me, that, that's got a lot of rugby league in it. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not trying to glorify rugby league. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's got a lot, a lot of rugby league in it. I, yep. mean, I think that's, that's the third lung that they talk about. I don't know if you know this, but they do talk about that. They say Volkanovski can go forever, mm -hmm. like literally go forever. I mean, you look like you'd have done three more rounds to me. Yeah, like it's 
it, it's weird. Obviously, you feel a little bit in there, but I mean, I deal with it very well. So I'll deal with, uh, you know, my you know, my legs. I'm feeling my legs. I'm feeling, you know, I'm, I'm still breathing heavy and I can still feel that, but I've just uh, deal with it much better where that's not, all right, doesn't matter. I've got a job to do. That's it. I don't care how tired you are. I, in preparation, I put myself, you know, I'm, I'm feeling it, but we just got to go anyway. And uh, we talked about last time we chatted and talking about, uh, you know, adjusting and adapting to things, uh, to things. And that's me in that choke is a, perfect example right like I I never looked at it I was like I was oh, like oh, it's done I'm gonna have to give up it was never like that it was what do I do next the lights are dimming like I refuse to just let me just go to sleep or I was like what do I do like it was never a, an option to tap or even go to sleep it was never an option it was like find a way so I was just trying to find a way pushing on the hips and doing stuff obviously by whilst being composed and uh, the lights were dimming and then uh, his arms, you know, for me being resilient and durable and and not panicking and staying composed, I was able to to obviously not go to sleep, which which helped. And then his arms started to tire. So my uh, resilience in that situation, you know, out, outdid him, right? So me, uh, his arms just started gassing and my light, the lights started uh, coming back and I'm like, he's done. And even in that situation where most people like – all right, give me a second. You know, again, I couldn't breathe. Like, you know, there was no blood and oxygen going to the brain, whatever it is that, that put you out, that was happening. Um, I'm getting choked. Even when uh, the lights started coming back, I'm still struggling to breathe. But as soon as his arms started going, I started get the, them lights started coming back. I'm like, he's gassing. As I'm getting up and I'm going to I'm gonna get him. You're going to bash yeah. him, which so you did. So I was already, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I was already thinking that while I was still getting choked. It's just, just uh, how I am. Again, it was, uh, I don't know. Like, again, it was never... Uh, a situation where I looked at it as, oh man, like I almost went down here. Get your breath back, you know, just in case you get put in another position or anything. It was never like that. It was, all right, he's, he's gas. We need to capitalize. We need to get on top and we need to try and finish this bloke now. And that's all I, I thought about in that exact situation. It's funny. So it's a good way of explaining like who I am and, and what I'm about. Like I feel like that choke. If people ask me like, oh, what type of fighter you are? I was like, oh, just watch that. Watch that little piece. That's, a, that's who I am. That's and that, that's going to go down, by the way, that bit of footage is going to go down as one of the greatest escapes of all time mm -hmm. in, in in UFC. I think I told you at the time, or a little bit after that, John Kavanagh contacted me and said, ask Volk, did he train for pushing on the hips? Okay. Kavanagh now uses that oh, okay, yeah. as part of his defence for that choke. Yep. It is a bit of a – I don't think I've actually been uh, taught that. But, I mean, I know, again, you teach me how to do – I think we might have touched on this as well. Teach me how to do a submission, I'll teach you how to get out of it. So, you know, like it's it's pretty simple sometimes. Like they need to do this, they need to turn this way, get this, you know, like their hip needs to be here and all that. It's like, all right, well, if I stop that hip from getting there or I stop this angle from happening, he can't apply the choke. You know, it can be that simple, right? But, I mean, a lot of people, are, you know – you know, they'd rather do some big fancy sweep or something like me. I'm going to make sure I don't go to sleep first, then I'll get up. You know what I mean? And again, that was uh, that exact position, pushing on the hip, which he did a great job. Uh, Brian will take it a great job of somehow keeping them hips connected. That's why I was still going out. I was doing everything right. And he was that good at that technique that he still almost got it. Uh, like the way he kept it, I don't even know how he's that flexible while he had my legs and that, like, even that position is very, very hard to do and to be strong in there. But luckily, uh, again, I was resi resilient enough and, and durable enough to get through it. And, and again, that never die attitude or never give up attitude really shine, shine through that moment. So is it going to be a rematch? Can you say, I mean, I, I heard, you, you know, he, he, he was talking about a rematch and you were talking about a rematch. I mean, is that something that's going to be, is in the plans or are you going to go back down? Because there's a couple of good new fighters. Back into featherweight. Yep. New Blake's knocking at your door. Yep. There's a new. It's always fun. Yep. It's always fun. Um, I watched uh, the the winner the winner of the featherweight division. Um, yeah, Rodriguez. Yep. Yep. He looks pretty good. He does. Uh, yeah. He's quite light on his feet. Different style of fighter. Yeah. I mean, like totally different mm -hmm. style of fighter. He's gonna do a bit of everything. Yep. Um, will you go back down to featherweight and go again? Well, I want to be. I want to be active. You know. You know. Made it clear. Even if I was going to be champion, I was going to get both belts. I was going to keep both divisions uh, busy, and I wasn't lying. I'm a man of my word. I want to be active, you know. I'm gonna, and I don't know when uh, Islam 
can run it back. I might have to wait too long by then. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to wait. So uh, it will probably be that one, uh, that that featherweight, I'd say. And uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Again, you like you choose? said. What's that do you sorry? get to choose, Alex? Do you, do, do you choose? Uh, well, what, I could uh, probably sit and just wait if I want, but I mean, you know, I'm not getting any younger. But I'm who about, chooses I'm, the fighters or does the matchmaker come? How does it work in UFC? We're at a stage where we all uh, communicate. You know, the management's going to talk to the UFC. What do we want? You know, where we want to go. Again, I could sit and rest if I want and that'll be perfectly fine. But then I've been busy. Then, oh, here I am. You know, what I've been doing in the, the past year or two, they're, they're going to be more than happy for me to just sit and, and chill. But that's just not what I'm about. I you know, want to capitalize on this time that I have, especially the position I'm in, being a champ or being a, you know, I'm at my peak at the moment, capitalizing that. You're you know still I mean? pretty, well, you're not very young. 35 but, uh, this year. Relatively so speaking. 34, turning 35. Uh, yeah, so. how, how do you feel about the age? Does the age at any stage right get now, your head? Right now, I'm all good. So yeah. it, it's fine. But, um, you know, again, you've got to look at it. You know, probably I want to be again me being at my peak and obviously experience everything and knowledge is all coming uh, at the perfect time right now. That's why I want to capitalize. If I can do this for another seven years, sweet. But I mean, is that uh, likely? I don't, I don't know. You know, what I mean, right now I feel like I could definitely do it for another few years. But again, uh, you know, we talk about you know my my greatest in investment or my my the, you know where I'm going right now is where I'm going to make the most money I can. You know, especially in, in in what I'm doing right now, so I need to capitalize on that. So if, I, if I want to build my empire and all that type of stuff, now's the time to to really uh, get a good base going going forward. It's the toughest game in the world, right? Mm-hmm. What you do, you build huge audience. Mm-hmm. Do you look at other products to sell into that audience? I mean, like look yep. at Ty, like mm-hmm. he's got the beer, the beer business out the Drink West, yep, and he's got a whole lot of other stuff going on out there. He's now got his own brewery built. Um, what is Alex Volkanovsky looking at? Again, as you said, the audience, right? You know, the the, the you know we're we we're, we're building our own, uh, you know, got our own audience now. We're at a position where, you know, like a you know, we you know we've got the, the followers and we've got our own audience, but we're lucky to have a platform like UFC to to really build that off. So you want to capitalize totally. on that too, right? Uh, moving forward, uh, again, you can see right now what I'm into a lot a lot of uh, the things the things that I'm into, like you know, with the cooking and thing, my YouTube channel and all that type of stuff. But obviously, investing. In uh, in things that uh, obviously I can help with too, right? So obviously there's going to be uh, some smart things that you can invest in and things like that, or you can uh, invest in things that I can help, right? With my yeah. with my platform, with uh, with me, like you know, uh, you can help promote, you promote yeah. exactly right. So uh, that that always helps. So it's- that's uh, obviously where where we're we're looking. Like you know, we've got you know we've got uh, gyms, shares in gyms, and like uh, companies and things like that as well. And then obviously. Yeah, things outside that. What about athletes, nutrition, those sorts of things like, you know, diet food, supplements? So like a CMBT. Uh, CMBT. Yeah, CMBT. So that's a you know, supplement uh, co- company, yeah, so the proteins. And so right now uh, we're into, you know, they've got energy drinks and things are all coming out now. So they're going through uh, um, your petrol stations and all that type of stuff as well. So uh, we're really uh, building that. Things are going really good with that as well. So thankful to be on board with that. And it's something that I've been – on board since the start. Yeah, I know. So uh, when they first came out, I was their first uh, sponsor and I've been there the, the, the whole time, you know what I mean? So it was, uh, yeah, they were my first, well, I guess they sponsored me, sorry. Uh, so I was their first athlete. So I've been on board with them. Uh, and I, again, it's a, something that I believe in. It's a it's a product that's obviously uh, a good product and, you know, I use myself. So well, why wouldn't I, uh, you know, sort of uh, – you know, invest in it. And so so CMBT own, is, it. is a protein drink and it's also – CMBT is – that's that's the that's company. So that's the supplement company. So they've got proteins, yep. energy drinks, amino acids, uh, all the stuff, protein bars. Yep. So, yeah, so we've got protein bars and energy drinks and amino acid uh, drinks, rehydration drinks and all that type of stuff. And, uh, yeah, so it's it's good. It works well with uh, my brand and what I'm all about. A lot of these are things that I'm I'm with, working with, even the gyms, like I'm Bang Tao, there's a gym in, in Thailand that we're in. Like well, obviously we've got friends in there but – a lot of things that uh, obviously make sense for me and my brand. Would you go into training when Alex Volkanovski? So would I? Would I train her? Oh, man, it's a. I do now. Like we, we, we like I help out at the gym and all that, and obviously you know we help with everyone there. But it's a commitment, you know. I mean, for everything I do, I'm I'm going to do properly, and like I, I don't feel like I can just be traveling around cornering, uh, traveling the world cornering uh, fighters, and and I just I don't think I could do. It. I don't think I, I want to make that commitment because again I'll commit to it. And I see guys that are like your John Kavanaugh's yeah. and um, 
you know, Eugene, even uh, Joe and, and Joe's got a small gym and still it keeps you busy. It's very busy. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of sacrifices they have to make, you know, sacrifice away from, you know, away from their family and, you know, all that type of stuff. It's, um, it, it is an easy job. So it's something that even though I love it so much, I just uh, don't think I can commit to it because uh, again, I don't want to let anyone down. And if I commit to something, you know, I have to do it properly and I just don't know if I could. I want to finish with one thing, Alex. Um, I've interviewed lots of great sportsmen, you know, world champions and lots of different things, great Australian sportsmen. Two common denominators that exist of what I consider to be the greatest ones I've had opportunity to interview. The first one is a sense of their self. In other words, they know who they are, they know where they stand um, in relation to, they know how good they are, but they also know their weaknesses. That's something that comes across from you to me. Um, you have that same instinct, that same trait, that same characteristic. The second thing which is always there, it's stamped on the DNA of these individuals, is that they're very bright. None of them been university, but they're very bright nonetheless. Their intelligence about their profession, mm -hmm. which is why they end up becoming the best or the greatest of all time, or in your case, the pound for pound, best fighter in the world in UFC and probably the toughest competition there is and the competition that everybody who does MMA, and by the way, MMA is a big deal around the world now, mm -hmm. wants to be that in the UFC. Mm -hmm. A true cheeky Aussie dude, 100%, but I just want to say to you, mate, you have those two traits and I want to say to you how proud all of Australia is. Well, I appreciate that. To everyone uh, watching as well, this is like the first uh, chat that I've, I've actually had probably from from the fight. So I just want to thank everyone for the support. Uh, it was incredible. And uh, obviously you could see that I was feeling that energy out there. And uh, again, I probably wouldn't be able to push out of uh, certain positions if it wasn't for the support I have around me from a team, family and all that type of stuff. And then from everyone that was watching and cheering me on. So thank you. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, dude.